Hi, this is James Weatherly. I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series called The Rules of Glass. You're going to enjoy this. There's a free ebook. I'll tell you how to get it at the end of the video. But today we're going to look at what pilots call the transition from steam power to glass. If you don't know those words, in just a few seconds, you're going to learn all about them. I hope you enjoy part one, the transition from steam to glass. I've lived through one of the greatest changes in aviation history. For pilots of my era, we nicknamed that the change from steam power to glass. Steam power were the old flight instruments that most of us learning to fly during the 50s, 60s, and 70s grew up with. I can remember my first experience with steam power. It was in my dad's V-tailed V-35 Beechcraft Bonanza. He no longer had to listen to the audio code of a range signal to tell left and right on an airway. He had a needle, a CDI, that would tell him which way to steer. He had a big, what's called ADF, Automatic Direction Finding Unit. It was gear-driven, weighed about 25 pounds. So at the time, he had a really top-of-the-line aircraft. But his aircraft featured lots of round dials and knobs. That's what I thought every airplane looked like. And during flight training, as a student pilot and an instrument pilot, we learned if we had the, quote, T package, which meant we had an airspeed indicator, an attitude indicator, an altimeter, and right below the attitude indicator, a directional gyro, sort of a standardized package, we had the latest modern type instruments. I'd flown airplanes that didn't have a T-package like my dad's Bonanza. Wow, it was crazy. You had to look and every airplane was different. When we got to the T-package, your instrument scan was the same each time. But there were no computers, no cell phone, no internet, and certainly no FMS or flight management system on board these type of aircraft. My first real airliner was a Convair 580, like the one you see in the picture. The picture you see is of a modernized Convair 580. Ours were not that nice. I definitely remember the co-pilot or the first officer only had a CDI, a course deviation indicator, and no HSI. The captain, however, did have an HSI, and we regularly flew into Wichita Falls, Texas, which had a back course approach. So the captain would always make the co-pilot or the first officer fly that approach to see if he remembered he had to turn in the opposite direction of his needle. The captain's HSI corrected for this problem, but not the co-pilot CDI. It had reverse sensing. This seems like the Stone Age, but this was everyday operations fairly recently. This was during the 1980s. When I left the Convair, I transitioned to the Boeing 727, commonly referred to as the three-holer. Really, the only difference was there were just more knobs and more dials, but no computer. We didn't even have the most simple thing. To get the ground speed, we had to look at this archaic DME readout that was kind of like a little rolling wheel, use our stopwatch, and manually compute our ground speed. The flight engineer, or the third pilot, was essentially our computer. All calculations were done by hand on a display the flight engineer called the tabletop or out of one of the performance manuals. I flew for a while as flight engineer on the 727 before upgrading to co-pilot and eventually captain. I can tell you personally, that flight engineer was a completely busy guy because he was just a human computer. My next stop, which would be my final stop in the world of uh, steam-powered airplanes, would be on the classic 74, the 74 100, 200, and 300. When I finally reached that point of the super steam power, on that airplane, there was an INS, an inertial navigation system, which seemed extremely cool. It allowed us to fly direct to a total of nine different points anywhere in the world. 
At the time, it seemed very fancy, but there were lots and lots more knobs and gauges than the 727. I remember vividly the first time I went in the cockpit on the 747 in the simulator. I looked at this what looked like 80 feet long. I don't know. It's about eight, nine feet long flight engineer panel. And I was just going, oh my goodness, thinking in my head, I'm glad I'm not the flight engineer. The very kind simulator instructor, Charlie, who was a retired 747 captain with Braniff, looked at me and said, look, James, you're now a captain. Somebody else is going to take care of all those knobs and dials for you. This was the pinnacle of steam power for me. Well, finally, in 1991, I got my chance to transition from the steam-powered 7.4 to the new all-glass 747-400. Even though I'd been flying professionally for 14 years, I'd been a captain on both the 727 and 747, the whole thing was totally overwhelming in transitioning to this new glass cockpit. I quickly realized that all the instrument flying and navigational skills I learned from the old round knobs and dials or the T configuration of basic flight instruments would have to be significantly altered to compensate for all these new television screens and keyboards. First of all, all my instrument scan was totally worthless. Now, instead of the T configuration, I'd look at what they told me was a PFD, a primary flight display, which was all the instruments times seemingly 10 in the amount of information displayed on a CRT. It was overwhelming. I didn't even know when I got in the simulator what I should look at, and it took quite a while to relearn that. Fortunately, we all received lots of simulator training because no one had this new skill down pat. Second of all, the navigation was like nothing else we had ever seen before. Before we were used to tuning up a uh, radio on a frequency for a VOR, centering the needles and following them. Now we had a keyboard and a quote scratch pad where Via this, what's called FMS, the flight management system, we type our flight plan in, the altitudes, the speeds, the performance, everything into this computer. The flight engineer was gone. He'd been replaced by a computer. And to make matters even more challenging, if one pilot changed something to FMS without telling the other pilot, it could be life-threatening. Well, that was my introduction to the glass cockpit. Hi, this is James again. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the transition from steam to glass. The next in the series will be about rules of glass, how the crew members work together. That's going to be very interesting. I'd love to hear what you thought about this video. Just write down below there, hit the like button, hopefully not the dislike, but if it's bad, let me know. And please send me a short comment. That's the way I know what you like so I can make more videos. Secondly, down in the lower right hand screen, there's a subscribe button. Please, if you're not subscribed, tap on that so you'll get an immediate notice of when my regular videos come out. Lastly, if you enjoyed this first video, you're going to enjoy the ebook, The Rules of Glass. Right up there on the upper left hand side of your screen, you'll see a little place you can click on says get your free ebook here. Click on it, it'll take you to a link where you can get your own ebook. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to you during the next episode.